And uh, so uh, I introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Robert Riener from the ATH Zurich, and is one of the world, probably one of the world top experts on rehabilitation robotics. And uh, as we, as uh, Ro uh, Rolf anticipated, is now, I should say, under the sun of California at uh, USC Los Angeles, but in this moment is probably under the moon. <laughs> so, so yes. you can, uh, the floor is yours, Robert. Uh. Thank you. I hope every, everyone can hear me. Is there a sound? So if you can hear me, uh, maybe, yeah. yes, good. So um, thank you very much. It's for me a great uh, honor and uh, fun uh, to participate at this lecture. Um, as you see, or as you have heard, I'm not in Zurich, where I usually am. I'm in uh, California and have two proofs to show you that I'm indeed in California. The first one is uh, on, the, on the back, what you see is actually my kind of curtain of my um, apartment. And if you here look outside, it's night, it's dark. So that's the first proof. And the second proof I have is here, my surf. Board. That's where I go to the beach. Okay, but now to the topic and to research. Design principles of intelligent rehabilitation robots. The rehabilitation robots uh, can be used in um, special work areas where there's a lot of intensive work necessary in the area of therapy. On this slide, now you see on the right-hand side, a typical classical way how patients are being therapied. Uh, these are patients with, uh, per, with uh, lesions, with paraplegia or hemiplegia, for example, after a stroke, when there's an injury in the brain due to some bleeding problems, the uh, large parts of the brain are losing the function. And this results in hemiplegia, where the half of the body is uh, not working anymore, for example, um, they cannot walk anymore. Um, other lesions are spinal cord injury, where they, you have the problem in the spine. Uh, and if the patients have an incomplete lesion, there's still some functions left, which may be enough to relearn gait, but it's uh, intensive. Patients have to do a lot of training. The training is done with the therapists. At least two therapists are at the ground, as you see it on the picture on the right. Sometimes you need a third therapist to stabilize the hip or the pelvis. And this is very uh, cumbersome. That's uh, intensive for the staff. That's exhausting for the staff. That's exp that's, uh, yeah, it costs money. The negative consequence is that the duration, the training duration for the patient is limited although we know that a longer training is better for the patients. And the gait pattern may not be optimal because the therapists may move um, not symmetrically or maybe after they get tired, the movement may not be as, as intensive as it should. This movement is important, what is going on in the patients. Due to the contact of the feet with the ground, due to the movement of the joints, efferent signals, Sensory signals of the receptors in the respective areas of the body are moving into the brain or the spine, and there some neuroplastic effects are going on. That means that some kind of healing effect can go on so that the patients may relearn gait or also upper extremity functions. That's a typical solution as it was developed in Zurich. You see um, the a robotic structure, an exoskeletal structure called the locomat, where patients can walk on a treadmill, where they are supported and guided through this exoskeletal device with um, an actuation in the knee joint and the hip joint. There's also a body weight support system being used. On the left part of this picture, you see a large screen um, where a special animation can be used to motivate the patients and to provide functional movements. On the next slide, you uh, see uh, different solutions. The locomat from Zurich is not the only exoskeletal device which has been developed, whereas not many solutions are commercially available, by the way. Um, many robots are still in development. You see on the top left um, one device, the gate trainer, which is an end-effector-based approach where the 
feet of the patients are connected to plates of the robot, and these plates are connected through a bar to a um, to a circular movement where a gate-like pattern can be trained. On the right, there's a geo that's a further that's a commercial version or a further developed version of the gate trainer. Also, an end effector based approach. And also the haptic walker belongs to the same group, also from the same research uh, group uh, with the same similar pattern. On the right part of, these, of this slide, you see several exoskeletal devices. Um, the Lopez, for example, from Holland, or the outer emulator from the United States. And another example is the Hall from Japan to Kuba University. That's a mobile exoskeletal device where patients are are, are supported in daily life for movements um, outside the clinical environment. Also for the upper extremities, there are several solutions. There is, for example, the Armin robot, which has been developed in our lab. You see this on this next slide. Uh, it's a device with seven degrees of freedom to actuate the shoulder joint, the elbow joint, the wrist joint, you can also support grasping function, and that's very important in order to allow activities of daily living. And this device is, you can, if you want so, you can call it a locomat for the arms. It's for training of the upper extremities because the same patients, like, uh, for example, stroke patients, also incomplete tetraplegic patients, can uh, be supported by this kind of robotic device. Also here there are other solutions, but here's a bit less available so far. Most of the devices are only commercially, are only uh, lab environments. The only commercial device available, um, which you can see here, is the MIT Manus and actually also the B-Mano Track. These are devices, again, for the upper extremities, but they're quite simple. Here the devices have um, maximally two degrees of freedom in order to support um, arm movements in a smaller range of movements. The other devices, the MGA or the Selford and the Kist arm and the Percro exoskeleton, these are all exoskeletal devices where the device is kind of surrounding the human body and the axis of the robot should be in alignment with the axis of the human. You see, for example, the Selford PMA is working with a pneumatic solution as well as the KIST arm from Korea, whereas the Percro from um, the Santa Ana in Pisa is uh, with standard um, um, electromagnetic drives where the forces are transmitted through cables. And there's also one uh, famous project, for the Gentle S, where the haptic master has been used as an end effector based approach. So the the problem now is that in all these devices, you need a special interaction between the human and the machine. And there are several design criteria which are important to consider to make this interaction, this kind of therapy, successful. First, the first aspect, all these aspects are based on human physiology and anatomy, is that we know that the nervous system is plastic. That means that we can train the nervous system if we have a repetitive movement, if you have intensive movement. So, however, when you do this kind of strong guidance by using a robot in a position control mode, the learning effect, the plastic effect is not so strong. There are no proofs in rehabilitation yet, but there are many studies in sports, in animal experiments, and so on. So, what is important is that the subject, the patient, has the chance to participate to the movement in order to increase the level of plasticity. That means that a robot has to be gentle, that the robot just supports as little as needed, and the human is active as much as needed, as much as possible. There are some proofs, as mentioned. Um, here you see on the slide, next slide, um, on the upper part, two studies with healthy subjects, with humans, where um, for example, in the study from Domingo and Ferris, it has been shown uh, that during treadmill walking on a virtual uh, bar, uh, that the learning effect is better when you give the subjects more freedom. Or in other words, if you 
to guide the subjects too much, this will hinder the motor learning of the patients, of the subjects, these are healthy subjects. A similar study has been done by Winstein and uh, another study was done by um, uh, Machal Prespo and Reinkensmeyer. Both these studies are for the upper extremities where these groups could show that a high frequency guiding is bad for the learning of the arm movements. You have a better success if you give some more freedom to the patients, uh, to the subjects. Then there's a famous animal study done by Kai and others uh, on rats walking on a treadmill. They are weight supported or gait supported. And also here it could be shown after they were lesioned with uh, spinal cord injuries that um, there's a better recovery if assist as needed training is done with these animals. That we transferred this knowledge into our locomat device. We are uh, having, um, we are performing studies together with the University Hospital Balgrist in the group of Armin Kurt and Volker Dietz, um, where we could do a so-called so path control. It means we give, we provide a kind of virtual tunnel around the legs. Inside this tunnel, the patient can move quite freely. So that's the participation of the patient which we provoke by this. But if the patient is deviating too much from this tunnel and touching this virtual walls of the tunnel, they're corrected through an impedance force. And if the patients are maybe too slow, then they're also assisted in the direction of the gate. These are the red arrows. The blue arrows are uh, meaning or representing their correction in perpendicular to the gate um, to the movement direction when they're touching the walls. And as a third aspect, it's important that in some phases when the patients are quite good after a while of training, but even within the gate cycle, that can be just some 10 milliseconds. If the patients are good, then the robot should behave transparent. So the subjects do not feel the robot, which is a challenge because we have here masses moving, we have inertia, friction, and so on, and that's a challenge to control. We did some evaluation of these studies uh, on several incomplete spinal cord injured patients by measuring their muscle activity through muscle myography. And what you see here is, as expected, the muscle activity gets higher when we apply this path controller. And that's good because we want that the patients are active. Now you could argue maybe that this activity is just unphysiological, unphysi maybe it's just more, more co-contraction, but we could show in some further analysis that the activity of the muscle is physiologically meaningful. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see that also the heart rate is increasing in this path controller, and that's what we want. The patients should be active as long as they do not get exhausted. Another important aspect, I'll come back now to the aspect of human physiology and what are the important design criteria. It's important when we learn movement that we do it often so that we repeat, but that we do not exactly the same movement so that the repetition is without repetition. You may know this also when you learn a new sport. If you learn tennis, for example, it's not good if you do exactly the same strike all the time, exactly the same position and movement. It's important that you have some variation. That has been formulated already by Bernstein 50 years ago. That's what you see. With our controller, with this path controller, we have automatically more variation because we give the patient more freedom. You see that this is fulfilled and we can expect a better learning effect due to this higher variability. Another important aspect is that we should provide a large range of movement. And while we provide this large range of movement, avoid joint stress. This large movement is important because um, we, we need a lot of activity of the patient. If uh, um, more muscles are actuated and um, a larger range uh, naturally leads to a better training effect. However, when you use an exoskeletal device, which we use, you must assure that the axis of the device is in alignment with the axis of the human. 
you see this here in this first part of the slide. In this case, this alignment is fulfilled and then there's no mechanical stress in the cuffs in the connection to the human of the rod. If, however, in this second example on the right-hand side now, you have a misalignment of the axis. You see this, that this rod, red little circle is outside the center of the human arm or human joint. If you now move the robot, you see that there's a misalignment occurs or some stress situation occurs. The cuff at the lower part, the connection of the robot to the human is not only changing its orientation a little bit, it's also moving in, X in the direction of the limb. This would mean that we get a lot of joint stress or stress in the connection, and that can be harmful, uncomfortable. In the worst case, it can also damage the joint and injure the patient. We have um, in our robotic solution, the, mo the biggest challenge is the shoulder, because at the shoulder joint, the, um, there is no real uh, joint and there is no ball and socket joint, for example. That means the center of rotation of the joint is moving. You see this in this little animation, I hope it's working, that the center of the rotation is moving upwards as a function of this orientation angle, as a function of this elongation. You see that up to 12 centimeters are moving upwards in translational direction for the center of rotation uh, as a function of this angle. This has been um, considered in our technical design. We have here um, the robotic uh, kinematic structure. You see there's a, a bar coming from a linear drive uh, reaching downwards to the arm of the, of the human subject, this long uh, diagonal bar. If the linear drive on the upper end moves upwards, the arm is elevated. So the arm is then changing its orientation. And now we, what we did is we connected, we, we designed a, a, a coupled um, mechanical structure. When, when the arm is now elevated, you see that the center of rotation, or actually the center of the humeral joint, is moving in translational direction upwards. In this way, we consider the anatomy of the human arm and did a study with 20 um, age-matched subjects, healthy subjects, and they said that it's, this feels much more comfortable because we do not cause any, any stress. Because most groups, what they do is they simplify the joints of the humans too much, saying that the joint is moving like a hinge joint or like a ball and socket joint, and this would not be correct in the case of the shoulder for these large range of movements. We, however, thought that the design, as we had, is still quite complex. The mechanics is too, um, there was too much backlash. It was too expensive to build it because we wanted to build some more of these robots. What we thought then is, okay, we can simplify this uh, um, property. You see, again, on this slide that we have um, a translational change of the humerus head while the angle is changing of the upper arm. We could simplify this kinematic property by finding an approximation, a center of rotation, which covers both, which covers this combination of rotational change and, and translational change. It's only an approximation. It's not the exact center of rotation because the center of rotation is still moving a little bit. We could verify and, and uh, realize this kinematic in a new mechanical structure. And here the specialty is that we leaned the axis a little bit backward. This is axis number one. It's leaning a little bit backward. That means that this axis is outside the human body, outside the humerus head, as we predicted with our special kinematic structure. We verify with these two laser dots on the skin or on the T-shirt of the subject if the shoulder is placed in the right way, which is in front of the axis number one, in order to fulfill the right kinematics of the human arm. The next design issue is, of course, the patients are different. Machines may look always the same, but the patients have different biomechanical properties, have different muscle properties, different anthropometrical properties. And that's an important issue when we design a robot. 
what we, how can we solve this? Of course, in the exoskeletal device, we have to assure that all the limb lengths can be adjusted to the individual limb lengths. Here you see some examples um, how we change the lengths of the limbs. Again, you see these two laser dots in order to assure that the position of the patient is right. That's an individual procedure which is done with each patient. Another thing which is done based on our controllers, in our force-based controllers, mainly forced or impedance-based controllers, we have realized them with potential fields. That means we have a force field which is always providing the force onto the human limb. Doesn't matter if we have this path controller or other controllers, it's always a force field which we underlie. And now we developed some model-based adaptive controllers which allow that this force field is changing and that is changing depending on the behavior of the subject, on the mechanical behavior of the human subject. You see on the right, for example, that the actual trajectory, the blue trajectory, is getting a bit closer to the red one. The red trajectory is the reference trajectory as we give it, as we recommend it for the patient. Another important design issue is motivation because of two reasons. We need a high motivation so that the patients are coming and participating at the trainings, at the therapy. Many patients do not understand the reason. For example, children or some elderly who do not have the right, motiv right, right uh, attitude or also no possibilities to come to the sessions. And the second aspect of motivation is that there are some studies, some basic research studies showing that with a higher motivation, you get a stronger plasticity stronger effects if you are really um, motivated to perform the movement. What we therefore did is we provide virtual reality, some technology which allows to motivate the patients. We have a display, a graphical display, we have a sound display, and we use our sensor recordings in order to change the audiovisual scenario in order to allow the patients to walk or to perform any kind of virtual task. However, this training can still maybe over-motivate the patients. That means that they're stressed. Maybe an older subject who is already quite busy to, to move and stressed may be overstressed. And then it's, we do not have motivation. Or maybe a younger subject is still bored and we do not really know how the motivation is. What we can do, and that's what we did in a European project called, called MIMICS, we tried to estimate the level of motivation by some psychophysiological recordings. So we recorded breathing, frequency, skin conductance, skin temperature, heart rate through electrocardiographic uh, graphical movement uh, recordings, which the signal also contained hard rate variability. And in this way, we could estimate the motivation of the patients, at least some discrete values, and change the audiovisual scenario in the right way so that the, that the patients are always motivated, not too much and not too little. Another important thing is that the movement has to be task specific, because it's known that you have to learn what you want to do. If you only gain an increase in force or an uh, increase in the range of movement, that might not be sufficient to have a transfer effect for daily life. So you have to train task-specific movements, activities of daily living. That's what we do. You see here our arm robot in the next slide, um, where a stroke patient is doing some virtual cooking task the patient could not do a real cooking task because the arm was too weak. Only with this virtual environment, they could start to do this training. And later, of course, they have to do also training in a real environment. And we implemented many different scenarios, um, washing scenario in a bathroom, a cutting scenario. So the meat or the uh, ingredients for the dinner have to be cut first before it's put into the saucepan. Uh, then a filling of a glass of wine or using of a ticket machine, playing a piano. All these tasks can be realized, can be performed by the patients and the patients together with the therapists are choosing the right task to have an efficient training. 
So these are the main ingredients. These are the main um, design criteria based on physiological aspects. And if you consider all these physiological aspects, it's possible that robots can allow an efficient and intensive and an individual individual training. And it's possible that the robot can cooperate with the patient so that the patient remains active, that the patients are participating to the movement. And if you provide the right technology, robots are also able to motivate the patient, at least in a lab environment so far. The chances in general are that this can increase or improve the health status and the quality of life of the patients. And for the therapists or nurses, rehabilitation nurses, it can reduce the workload of the clinical staff. But what is still necessary are a lot of proofs, a lot of evaluation studies on patients. And that's not so easy, otherwise you would have done it already. It, it's a problem because you need to get patients. You need patients with certain inclusion criteria. And the variability among the patients is very large, so that you need usually a large number of patients to get enough statistical power in order to prove something. There's so many conditions which you can prove and try out, different kind of virtual reality aspects, three-dimensional views, two-dimensional views, audio on and off, what's better for the rehabilitation, different kind of force support, different kind of actuation, how many joints do you want to actuate, only more distal, more lateral, uh, more um, proximal. So there are many open questions which need to be tested. That's all for my talk. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, I think we have time for uh, a few questions from the Global Lecture Hall, in particular also from here in Madrid. I hope we have some questions. Can I ask a question? Yes. Sure. Uh, yes, it's Moscow State, State University for the Humanities. Thank you very much. Fascinating, very motivating lecture. Uh, you mentioned um, that the nervous system is plastic and also you mentioned a very important issue about repetition without repetition. And uh, I agree with you. We say that to increase creativity we should confront every day something different. If we repeat the same things without anything new, there is no creativity. But could you expand on your thesis on our nervous system being plastic? I mean, if we get back to this concept of plasticity, could you expand a little bit? Because it's not quite clear why you call it plastic. Is it a metaphorical use of the word plastic or is it <laughs> direct? Thank you. Yes. It's um, the term plasticity or neuroplasticity is a common term in neuroscience. Of course, it does not mean the mechanical plasticity as a mechanical engineer would understand it. It means a functional plasticity. And what it means exactly, for example, if you have a stroke, if someone has a stroke, it means that um, nerve cells in the brain are dead. And there's no chance so far to get, give them back any life at the moment. And there's no therapy which can recover nerve, nerve function. However, other regions in the brain can take over the function which are lost. Yeah? If the arm is lesion, if the muscle cannot be um, activated because the res responsible nerves are dead, other nerves can take over this function so that you can relearn and reactivate this muscle. And this kind of transfer effect that's or this kind of recovery is one aspect of plasticity. Uh, other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Ah. You're welcome. So, other questions? Mm. Actually, uh, I, I have a, I have actually I have plenty of questions, but. Um, uh, let's say I have main, two main questions. One uh, is uh, about uh, the involvement, the motivation uh, of a patient. Uh, you, have you considered at least for uh, younger uh, um, patients uh, to, to implement a kind of gaming environment? First, que um, first question. Yes. Yes, we have uh, many games involved. And for the young children, for example, one game they play with a gauge robot is a soccer. 
they see themselves on a large screen as an avatar with a white T-shirt, and the task is to move fast, to provide force, to, to generate force. And if they move too slow, then an opponent will come and take away the ball. But if they have the ball because they move fast, they can shoot it, and they can even feel it because the robot is programmed as a haptic display. They can shoot a goal, they can shoot the ball in a steep way, a long way, or a soft way. And when they shoot a goal, they get a reward because the audience is then crying. And the children who play this, they... They love it and they get exhausted. They're sweating. They do not want to stop anymore. That's just one example of a game. And maybe you also consider this something similar for elders uh, or it's more difficult maybe? Yes, um, for elders we have, um, we have to adapt it um, because they may not play soccer on their own. But um, we have uh, uh, they walk through a virtual forest with uh, birds singing, and you can see some deers running uh, across the path. And um, if they're demot demotivated, still we can then uh, appear, let appear a canyon, and it gets deeper and deeper. If they still do not get motivated or engaged, and there's a bridge which we have to pass, and the bridge can start to sway in the different ways to make it exciting also for them. No, and then, uh, let's say, I, I don't want, when I will leave some more minutes for other questions, I have a, a, about the problem of a, a clinical trials. How you, you think you can approach this? Because I think it's, since you are targeting the medical environment, it's an important issue, right? So yeah, but, how do you um, think to overcome these problems uh, of uh, having enough statistics? Or Yes. Uh, I think we have to do um, work together with other hospitals and um, many different features and conditions can be done at different clinics and and in each clinic people have to think how to do a careful selection of different features to have to to get the experiments done with limited um, or or satisfactory effort um, yeah, that's, we have to work together with other clinics. There's one initiative now called, um, the uh, it's a cost initiative from the European Union, where people already work together, for example, to define different assessment strategies. And we have to do this international collaborations in order to get further. I see. So are, are there any, uh, any other questions from the Global Lecture Hall? No, probably not. So let's uh, thanks uh, again, uh, Robert. Uh, thank you very much for this very Welcome. inspiring talk. And thanks. enjoy the sun. <laughs> yeah, thank you.